and welcome to the first session. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, good evening. Good evening. So uh, just a quick round of introduction. Um, to Abhishek, but Abhishek and Ajaz, I'll introduce uh, both of you to each one. So uh, Abhishek, uh, so starting off with Abhishek, Abhishek is someone Ajaz who has been working for, has been working into um, into stock markets and into the into the financial side of things, and he has been actively involved in financial modeling, and uh, he's working, he's presently working for Thomson Reuters. And he's based out of Bangalore. And Abhishek happens to be a previous student of mine when I was actually into uh, I was more 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 into academia. So that's Abhishek. Uh, hi Abhishek, welcome to MRM Market Risk Modeling. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, Abhishek, uh, Ajaz is a very senior risk advisory professional working for one of the big four, and is based out of Middle East presently. He heads, uh, I mean, he almost heads uh, the organization from the Middle East side. And he's been, uh, so he has previously been with us for the credit risk modeling module. And he's back for the market risk modeling. Uh, thank you for your confidence, Ajaz, and welcome to market risk modeling. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, So basically, uh, uh, for the market risk modeling session, uh, so as we proceed along with the market risk modeling session, uh, rather let me put it this way, before we proceed for, uh, so, uh, so as we move uh, forward with, before proceeding to the market risk modeling session, so there are a couple of things that we would like to, I would just like to discuss. First of all is, uh, so basically talking about a few important things, uh, talking about the materials first of all, to, so basically the course coverage you guys have a fair idea because we have had uh, you have gone through the brochure right so I would be covering all those aspects so there would be a lot of time series modeling involved into the discussion so there would be a lot of um, time series modeling involved this time which was not prevalent uh, you know mostly in <coughs> uh, the I mean which was not presently uh, there while we had discussed credit risk modeling so basically, uh, there would be a lot of forecasting, there would be a lot of bar uh, value at risk and se several such concepts and a lot of uh, mathematics, uh, I would not say mathematics as such, but a lot of symbols over here, right? Because finance is all about symbol and this is a very core finance model that we will be talking about. Now, so basically, yes, uh, the study, talking about the materials of analysis or the materials of study, that would be quite different from what we had seen, what Ajaz you have seen in the credit risk modeling session. So uh, since this time, I am I am the person who would be, you know, uh, coordinating the market risk modeling sessions as well. So I would be uh, sharing out all the recordings after the end of the class. So over the week, you can go through it. And another set of added material that would go out is in terms of the board works that I would be doing over here in the soft board. So I would be exporting them in the PDF format and circulating it, right? In addition to that, uh, there would be a uh, little bit Excel sheets and obviously, yes, uh, SAS editor windows that would be circulated out. So uh, in terms of material, this time uh, market trust modeling is going to be more comprehensive, right? So this is the first time Abhishek is doing things on this platform with me. So I look to a for I look forward to a very good uh, uh, you know a very interactive session like we used to have previously as well. So uh, uh, so so that so that's about it. And uh, so today it will be more or less of an introductory session. So what is market risk? What are the different components of market risk? How does market risk fit into uh, the into the regulatory framework, why is it important, why, from what aspect uh, or how is it that we can look to have, uh, I mean, so why is it important, uh, why is market risk modeling important, what exactly makes market risk uh, more, you know, what makes market risk so important in the domain and in the business, right. So this is, uh, so basically we would be talking more about the scope of uh, market risk modeling and from there, we would be gradually proceeding towards uh, one by one. Uh, first of all, with an overview, then with the statistical techniques, and then we'll be pulling them together 
to understand to explore the different modeling techniques that are mostly used in the domain of market risk right so just to uh, so to start off right so as starting point uh, it would be uh, so we so basically as we start off uh, so the basic question that we uh, always need to answer is uh, what exactly is risk or what exactly in particular is banking risk so what are the different sources from which a bank uh, faces the risk or like the bank would actually expose. so what are the different types of risk which a bank is generally exposed to so when i talk about risk uh, the first thing that risk uh, that comes to my mind is risk is or risk implies uh, uncertainty right so risk implies uncertainty and when i talk about uncertainty the most important uh, concept or the most important thing that comes out to me is uh, the concept of probability right so when i talk about something when i talk about probability in specific right so answer so from uncertainty stems out something called uh, stochasticity so when i say stochasticity stochasticity is a technical term used for events which are driven by probability distributions so for example if i lend out 100 rupees to a person right to a borrower so then there is always some chance that the borrower will pay me back the money and secondly the borrower will not pay back the money to me so basically what i have is i I, I what I'm looking to is I'm looking forward to a full set of probability distribution. So there are probabilities associated with the possible outcomes. So I know what are the uh, possible outcomes, and I know that with each outcome there exists a probability, or there is a probability associated with each and every outcome. However, I what I do not know is what exactly is the probability that a particular or which outcome will realize in which particular trial. so stochasticity is something it's a scenario which is driven or which is uh, characterized by probabilities right now where is this stochasticity created due to risk and when i say that risk creates a lot of stochasticity or risk brings along with is a lot of stochastic events so where is this stochasticity created so this stochasticity is created in the cash flows of the bank right so it is created in the cash flows of the bank so the stock so the bank so what becomes just uh, yeah. one just yeah, one question the meaning of stochastic i'm coming to that abhishek i'll come to the technical side of things i'll come to that sure yeah sure, sure. yeah so basically uh so when i say uh, so basically stochast uh, yeah so as i was saying risk from risk it comes to uncertainty and from uncertainty so uncertainty relates or it creates stochasticity in the cash flows so let's use an example before i move into that right so for example uh, there is a bank right which is uh, lending out to a particular person so i have a bank so or there is a loan of some amount which is being lent to a particular person say a loan of 1 lakh rupees is being lent out right so there are uh, there are two borrowers or uh, there is a borrower to whom this loan is being given now there are two probabilities one is the borrower will default the second is the borrower will not default and now to this there is always a set of chance or there is always a chance which is involved to it so so basically there is a 30% chance that the borrower will default and there is a 70% chance that the borrower will not default And there is a 70% chance that the borrower will not default right so there are 
so there is a whole set of probability which is associated over here so probability so the so the distribution that i have over here so to this i have to each of the outcomes of this particular event or to of this particular uh, occurrence i have two possible outcomes right so this default may occur with a sudden chance and the non default may occur with a sudden chance that means what at the crux what i see is that they getting back the money is uncertain for me so i am really very uncertain about the fact that i'll get back my money so getting back the money is not a sure event right so if it is not a sure event then it is called a stochastic event so a stochastic event or a probabilistic event is one which has a probability distribution associated with it so if the event is such that there are different outcomes and each outcome has some probability of occurrence then that event is called an uncertain a probabilistic or a stochastic event or as to say a stochastic outcome Clear, Abhishek? Yeah, uh, it's clear. So any event uh, where there might be, where there are more than one outcome, so it can be referred to as a stochastic. Yeah. So basically, event. which is or more more importantly, where there is a probability distribution, so where the outcomes are probabilistic in nature, right? So for example, okay. if I invest in a stock market. So if I invest in a stock, right? so there is always yeah. chance that the stock price may go up the stock price may go yeah. down or there is an average return and a variance right associated with every stock yeah. so when you look into yeah. the average return and the volatility what does it say it says that on an average you may get this return with an average variation yeah. of this that means what i can get any okay. values between that average and plus minus 3 sigma right so that means exactly so that means what so there are a lot of possible are like possible return values that i have and to each return value okay. there is a probability of occurrence right so okay. if i am investing okay. today i know that the average return is 100 and the plus minus variance is say 5 uh, okay so then i can always yeah. get an outcome between uh, there is a 99.99% chance that i'll get an outcome between yeah. 85 to 150 right so yeah. that is what yeah. i know so therefore so that means what so there is a whole dis probability distribution associated with all the return values that i may get so between 85 and 115 yeah. i might get multiple returns now which return i will exactly yeah. get that is what i don't know so that means that outcome yeah. is characterized by a probability distribution right and yeah. hence that is stochastic event okay got it. thank you great great uh so this is so this is what the con so this is so whenever you are actually lending out or whenever a bank is investing into assets the bank knows that uh that there are certain chances that their returns may not realize they may lose out on the return they may make a gain on the return if they make a gain so there is a certain percentage of a gain that they can make there is a certain probability to that a certain loss that they will make there is a probability to that so everything is determined by probability and therefore the cash flow that that will come for the bank that is also stochastic in nature so the existence of this uncertainty in the lending environment does not allow the bank to have a fixed cash flow so it is not that like in a for a salaried person every month we will get a a uh, fixed cash flow at the end of the month it is not like that right so as an organization so even if i think about dexlab as an organization our cash flows are also stochastic in nature so there is always an element of uh, risk involved in whether when given that a person approaches us what is the probability that he will get converted into a customer so so that there is a cash flow so i, I mean there is a stochasticity involved in every possible outcome right and this risk is something which is which is uh, characterized thoroughly into the, or is ingrained into the business domain so 
so our objectives as a bank a bank can never play a very safe game right so the bank always has to take some risks and taking risk is the business of the banks right so basically if i think about a bank's uh, strategy so then let me talk about a bank's uh, strategy so as a bank i have two options lend out 100% first is lend and the second is not lend not lend so not lending is perhaps the safest uh exercise that a bank can do right i'll not lend i'll not create any credit i'll not lend so over here the risk involved is 0% so the bank is not lending now the next part is where the bank decides to lend everything so basically if the bank in deposits they get 100 100 rupees they are lending out the entire 100 rupees so if so the risk is 100% if they lend the entire amount so now the over here when the bank is lending the bank has two business problem or the bank has two characteristics one is lend 100% of the deposits so whatever deposits the people are giving in the bank the bank is investing it or is lending it in total and over here is lend out some x percent now if the bank is lending out 100% the risk that the bank runs into is also a 100% risk so assuming that there is a huge default and the bank does not keep back anything uh, as reserves or against as provisions as bad debts and Let's assume that all the borrowers who have taken the credit, they go into defaults. Then the bank will obviously go in for a collapse. So when the bank is lending, lending and lending out 100%, the risk that they are exposed to is 100%. Right. So neither this. So this is obviously not a feasible stand for the bank, and this is neither is this a feasible stand for the bank. because in this the bank runs a risk of bankruptcy and over here the bank runs a, a a separate kind of a risk that if people are keeping the money in the bank right so they can act just as a safe keeper of the money as a locker nothing else right so there is no growth now what the bank generally does is or any bank they generally take try to take a path in between where they need to optimize between risk and growth so for the big, the biggest optimization problem that any bank has to satisfy uh, has to solve is a risk versus optimization or basically sorry a growth versus conservativeness or growth versus stability kind of a problem right so basically what they do is growth growth versus conservativeness so what they basically try to do is they try to understand that uh, how conservative is a particular account or or how con so basically they need to understand how conservative they need to be vis-a-vis -vis how much growth that they desire now this is driven by a lot of the, this decision is a very subjective decision right and you cannot always solve a vis-a-vis -vis a mathematical optimization problem and solve it so however there is a growth versus a conservativeness kind of a debate that the bank has always to solve right and it is this part that we need to address right and it is this part where this entire concept of risk management comes in right so this this entire uh, portion so if i talk about growth versus conservativeness so it is this entire portion where which gives birth to the problem or to the land, to the business of risk 
management so i need to take calculated risk as much as possible so this is where it talks about the risk management so uh, in a nutshell we can say it's about finding the correct x exactly and that is where the entire challenge arises right so if i am trying to find okay. out that okay. x percent that i must be either investing or i must be uh, lending out so what is that optimal x that is where this entire game comes in so that is where this entire risk management principle comes in where you need to analyze the different risk sources that a bank faces and how is it that you can manage the risk at each of these different portions right so yes abhishek you are actually correct when you say that uh, this is the x percent which is there right and i need to optimally determine this x percent how much of the total funds should i be investing somewhere so how much of this funds should i be lending out and uh, and decisions like that right so and as a part and as a uh, interest rate differential the bank makes it profit so what the bank does is the bank borrows from a low risk segment which is the depositors and give them a relatively low rate of interest and use those funds in relatively high risk situations like which might be used for investments which might be used for lending out and from there what they do is they they get a higher rate of return and the return interest differential is the profit of the bank right so the entire profit of the bank is contingent on the fact that the money comes back to the bank along with the return which probably did not happen at the beginning of the financial crisis right so in in those crises i mean if you look into if we go back during those uh, pre financial crisis days uh, we would see that there was the economy was actually booming right so after uh, the 911 attacks the us economy or rather i might go back even a bit so at the beginning of this century in the year 2000 so what happened was there was the collapse of this dot com bubble which was there which uh, us has been experiencing where the you know the prices of the it stocks were soaring sky high and following a market correction uh, these stock prices started coming down and the dot com bubble actually collapsed so when that bubble actually collapsed there was the us markets had faced a huge amount of loss right so a uh, huge amount of loss in the uh, such that a, a huge amount of market wealth was actually lost in those stocks when people actually realized that they had overpaid and over invested in the stock and they could not recover it from the markets right so following that the us economy started going into a recession which got aggravated in the year 2001 following the 911 attacks now after that the us economy had gone down to a kind of a very stringent recession now to overcome that recession they needed some very outlandish idea and this outlandishness of the idea was driven by expanding consumption expenditures so it is a basic economic theorization that if your economy is a demand demand driven economy like most economies are then if you are actually going down into a demand trap right there is a low demand low aggregate demand creating low supplies which resulting in unemployment in the long run then what you need to do is you just need to boost in the expenditures in the economy and those expenditures will keep on actually multiplying the output and then the income and then the output in a you know you know in an accelerator uh, framework and will keep on in boosting up your economies and that is what us economy us had actually done what they started doing was they started boosting up the consumption expenditure and as such the uh, rate of interest on the consumption loans were cut down as low as 1% now following this what had happened essential what happened essentially was that the consumption economy uh, the consumption sector actually expanded now as the consumption expand uh, the consumption sector expands uh, what happens is the aggregate income of the economy starts going up right and as the consumption uh, 
so basically what happens is say today i see that the consumption expenditure in my economy is going up right and the retail sector is actually boosting so next comes the demand for credit to finance that consumption right now so that that boosts up your retail portfolios of the bank in terms of secured and unsecured as so in, in the essentially in terms of unsecured lending after that what happens is uh, following that can you just repeat the last part can you just repeat the last part once like after the consumption expenditure okay, 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 okay. for economy so basically yeah. when the uh, consumption expenditure for an economy increases right, what happens is uh, so basically producers from the production side the producers expect an increased demand for their products right so by now the inventory that they had accumulated they rapidly start running down the inventories now if they have to rapidly run down the inventory they need to create an added demand on the i mean they need to have very strong demand on the other side so in order to yeah. do that what is done is the rates of interest on consumption loans are slashed down so if i am not mistaken okay. if, I, if i remember correctly during uh, you know immediately after the crisis struck uh, like the after the 911 attacks after some times say a uh, quarter down the line the rates of consumption loans in us was slashed down as low as 1 or 1.5% so okay. that was the yeah, the allen greenspan era so allen greenspan was the federal reserve okay. chairman at that point of time the federal reserve governor so uh, what so basically when the loan the interest rates of consumption loans gets slashed down right now what are quarter consumption loans how are consumption loans financed by the households they are financed by uh, you know credit cards or they are financed by uh, you know these uh, credit cards then your personal loans etc so basically the demand side the credit demand and the retail portfolio of the bank started expanding right now with cheap consumption loans and cheap access to consumption credit consumers started expanding as uh, consumers started buying more and more of consumer goods and the inventory which had accumulated over a span of time due to slack demand got run down fast so as the inventory started running down now came the requirement for added production and that is where the employment also started gradually expanding right and as employment starts increasing the overall uh, the average income also starts improving over a span of a quarter or a couple of quarters now within one year it was seen that the consumption expenditure has increased and the overall aggregate income of us had also increased in the year say 2003 4 like this now when on an on an average the economy's income starts increasing what happens is your demand for housing starts increasing so people start demanding more and more houses because the moment i start uh, you know start earning high amount of income what happens is i start require i i requirements for real estate products also start increasing right so what happens is you would see that whenever an economy is growing or is in a it overcomes a recession it starts expanding it's in the recovery phase the as the gdp increases the real estate prices also keeps on increasing right now following that what happened is people the now the banking system started playing its own game what they said is that fine you are a consumer and my expectations are that the housing sector is actually growing and the housing prices are escalating and they are shooting up now i assume that you are a borrower who cannot who does not have the you know the capacity to pay back the loan but you have the house and that house price is increasing so even if you are unable to pay back i will mortgage your house against the loan that i am giving you for your house and i will recover it by selling your house because the house prices are increasing and it was seen in the us that across different regions there were some regions uh, in florida and some parts of us where in the south coast in the north coast and so on where the housing prices had shot up at 114% in the span of 2 years and the overall housing prices in the us economy as a whole 
had shot up between 70 to 80 percent in a span of a couple of years, which was way below I and mean, which was way above what the fundamental rates of increase used to be. So people could realize that the demand for housing segment had actually increased. Now, what the US people or the US banking system tried to do was they tried using housing or real estate as an instrument to give more and more credit to play that credit game. So suppose today I have a house which is worth two lakhs, right? And in a span of six months, I realized that, okay, my house is now worth uh, five lakhs. So what I do is now I am now eligible for an additional loan of three lakhs from the bank and the bank would give it against my housing assets. Now the problem on the side of the banks was that the banks did not realize that housing prices were way above what the uh, long run average trend was and now it was actually shooting much over what over the long run average trend so the long run i, I mean uh, if i'm not mistaken the housing prices were nearly 112 to 200 times over the above compared to the long run average trend in us during the period of 2005 to 7 so what happened was that after a point of time the market started correcting its market started setting its expectations back and they realized that they were actually overpaying for the houses and that the houses were thoroughly overpriced. Now, when this market correction came in, when the expectations on an aggregate got corrected, right, uh, expectations got reset, that is where the housing prices plunged. Now, when the housing prices plunged, the banks entered into a terrific amount of loss because now they could not now there would be huge amount of defaults because people would not be able to pay back whatever loans they had taken whatever houses they, they had taken and against those houses by selling those houses i cannot recover what i had given the loan that the bank had given and hence the banks faced huge amount of losses now these were huge amount of toxic loans right which were written of of the bank's balance sheet and how were they written up so that is where the role of the investment bankers came in the investment bankers started designing very specific specialized instruments right out of these loans and they designed it into very you know into very attractive derivatives with attractive ratings and they, they put it on show for international investors to pay their money in. And when huge financial institutional investors had invested in those bonds, right? Now it was realized that, so once the housing bubble collapsed, right? So those derivatives also became opaque. And like if people could not repay back the money, there was no chances of recovery, right? And hence, Lehman Brothers also defaulted on the repayment of uh, the uh, on the payment obligations and huge amount of funds from investors all across the globe got trapped into these uh, uh, you know these specific instruments which were no more tradable right so the entire globe at that point of time was actually riding a bubble base which was way above what the fundamental values of the assets could be and the entire system they entered into play this uh, game right and when the bubble actually collapsed it was realized that the total cost of the uh, the total loss which was caused within us itself was around three to four trillion dollars no sorry it was around 13 trillion dollars and uh, across the Globe-wide, uh, globe-wide, I don't remember the figure, but it was much more. It was a very pathetic scenario where the government finally had to step in to make the bailouts. Now, now this, the fact that, so in, the entire event had happened, originated in, in the US and could have collapsed in the US. Had the investment banks like Lehman Brothers and like uh, Morgan Stanley and some of these Merrill Lynch and all, they had not they stepped in, in creating these special instruments, these opaque instruments and sending them off uh, globally. So when the global investors stepped in and when those and when these big investment banks collapsed, 
the investors wealth also went along with it and a huge amount of property worldwide was actually lost and hence the entire world entered into a global recession right from india in fact icici was a bank which had invested in huge amounts into these uh, securitized assets which where they lost huge amount of wealth right now what had happened into for these institutions was and this entire crisis which had resulted out of this entire thing or out of this entire behavior as, as i would say this entire crisis had uh, happened because the regulators were not there so there was no regulation there was no control on you know uh, channelizing the investors money and the bank banks mostly has they mostly had taken this 100% uh, loan strategy where they were actually lending out almost 100% of their funds without keeping the appropriate provisions for bad debts and they were just writing off all the toxic assets of their balance sheet by creating specified instruments special instruments right so the off balance sheet assets were actually very toxic so now once this global and and so basically when this entire financial system collapsed right so regulators all across the world realized that it's now time that the financial order be regulated the properly the risk associated with the behavior of the with the banks that is the sources of risk associated with the banks be assessed properly and based on that uh, the decisions be taken so from that perspective uh, the entire so basically from here this overall entire uh, this entire regulatory framework and the assessment of each of these regulatory frameworks like be it basel accords be it your ecar be it dfas or be it other regulatory stuff that had come up right now it is a time for ifrs 9 implementation and stuff like that ccl and all so in re in respect of this or, or against that background these regulations actually came in play where each of these regulations emphasize on two very simple facts number one each of the sources of risk which a bank needs to uh, or a bank is exposed to must be uh, properly analyzed number 1 and number 2 adequate capital should be kept back which would help the bank to you know sail through periods of downturns and if there are defaults or if there are uh, losses which the bank faces then the bank must have sufficient amount of capital stored back which would actually help them prevent themselves or uh, like you know uh, what should i say cushion themselves against the huge losses that they may face so having said that right so so having said that all these regulations and all these model developments all these model validation activities have come into play right so so this is mostly the background under which all these the increasing risk for credit risk model development market risk model development operational risk uh, model development validation have come up i, I would not say come up they had al always been there but the emphasis on these models have increased separately right now regulators know that that i uh, so i must assess all the risk of the bank risk that the bank faces i must give aside sufficient capital for the bank to prevent itself against losses i must keep aside capital which will prevent the bank to you know to move against uh, or to survive through a periods of extreme downturns which is called stress testing so basically i must have models which will help the bank decide on proper investment avenues i must have uh, models which will help the bank decide very quant in a quantitative manner plan out its amount of credit that it must be giving out to people to whom it must be giving out the people how much of credit it must be giving out to people how much should it invest in which of the bonds or which are the assets that they should invest how must they diversify their portfolio and so on so there are a lot of these regulations which have come around in helping the bank or in determining how the banks must uh, decide on their operations right and in this aspect we we will be discussing one of the major sources of risk 
that we call market risk the risk to which banks are exposed based on their investments so how much of assets that they must invest right so which are the shares or, or or which are the assets where they must go ahead and invest what are the different types of investment instruments what are the different types of risk to which the bank is exposed following the movement or following the fluctuations in the uh, you know in the the market scenario so talking about the credit risk side of things so over there the risk management takes the form of deciding that when a obligor comes in asking for a loan how much of loan should i be giving uh, to whom should i be giving the loan how much of credit must go in how do i monitor how the performer borrower is performing based on that how do i take decisions for building a score card and so on right so over here our focus would be or to would totally be on and assessing how much of credit or how much of uh, like how should or, or, or to decide or to understand how would bank decide on investment opportunities right so what are the different investments what are the, what are the different instruments of investments what are the different sources from where market risk might arise right how do i predict the market risk etc right so this is uh, mostly a uh, overview of the discussions that would be done so i'll just take a pause over here and i would like to take up any questions i mean questions if there are any Great. so by referring to market risk <clears throat> which is which are the market from which uh, we can ex expect a yeah, risk i'm coming to i'm coming to that i'm coming yes. to that uh, detailed description i'm just coming to that okay. okay so before we move on to uh, to talk about uh, you know market risk and all so before i move into the you know into the different into the broader aspect of market risk so there is uh, one major uh, factor that uh, that we need to understand i mean understanding how this uh, factor operates right the justification for understanding market risk as to why we study market risk why market risk should be studied will be very clearly specified right now one thing to understand is that if you look at the global financial order at the present day we can see that the global financial order is highly integrated right so country a is connected to country b country b to country c country c to country d like this now if they are connected with each other right how are they connected they are connected through trade and business channels right and through other financial linkages out of which one one very critical linkage is that of multinational corporations now when i talk about multinational corporations so they, it, it's a very broad term so if let's we be just focusing on the you know on the financial sector side say for example i have uh, say for example let's take hsbc so the hong kong shanghai banking corporation is a bank which is headquartered in london right and that's the mother country of operation however they have significant operations all across the globe across all the continents right and it's not that their uh, global presence is insignificant they have a very significant uh, global presence all across right so if they have a very significant global presence all across what they need to understand is so so that means uh, they are very important players when it comes to exploring uh, you know when it comes to exploring the the employment or i mean to to, to influence the employment output of the nation so each of these so hsbc as a banking organization has played a very critical role in determining the employment factors in a region the banking in a region so basically what would happen if hsbc collapses suddenly so if hsbc collapses today then there would be the first impact that would be there is at around uh, 75 to 80000 uh, 
people would immediately get unemployed all across the globe or it might the, the number might range to millions as well right so there might be a huge number of people who just get out of job so the global although the globe can experience a recession the moment this bank collapses why because this bank is connected very significantly and and this bank has significant exposures in each of the banking each of the international portfolios so standing from there what we can clearly see is that hs uh, an organization like hsbc is very important not only to the region where it is operating but to the globe as well so such organizations are called globally systematically important financial institutions that is gcps globally systematically important financial institutions so they have a huge extent of interconnectedness between the geographies so if any upheavals happen in the london headquarter today and there are any major shocks that the london headquarter faces then there is a huge chance that there would be there would be a a set of shocks which will ripple through the different geographies so for example london uh, uk portfolio today shrinks right or the bank collapses in uk the pulse and the most direct uh, impact is there would be a cost cutting and there would be huge amount of employees who would be rammed up right and that leads to an increase in unemployment in uk first now the moment this happens if the uk operations get slashed in one of the countries somewhere over here so be it in india be it in uh, uh, china or be it in somewhere across the globe be it in hong kong there is a team which is supporting the operation so there is a bpo team which is supporting the operations at uk so that team gets rammed down right so similarly the, then when the when headquarters ram down there is a loss of confidence so people would be drawing out funds from that bank as such the deposits with the bank will shrink the bank's capacity to earn profits will actually shrink and hence the bank will start cutting down employees more and there will be a spillover impact from uk to india and to other areas wherever it is operating right and on and as a result on the whole a set of you know there would be an increase in the unemployment so if a globally systematically important financial institution collapses it has long reaching effects on the globe like the likes of lehman brothers so when lehman brothers actually crashed the world entered into a recession so till before lehman brothers crashing down it was the recession or the impact of the downturn was limited to us but the moment lehman brothers crashed this is the thing that had happened and the entire globe entered into a downturn this is where the entire problem happens and that is why you need to be very sure that your globally systematically important financial institutions do not crash because if they crash or if they collapse in any possible way it would not only lead to a huge recession but it would also impact the stock markets as well right there would be huge amount of wealth loss all across the globe whoever has invested in the stocks of that organization right so for example hsbc itself is a very reputed brand right and hence the investment into that and hence the stock prices are expected to be relatively high or to be very high in the market so they are listed hence it is very important that such organizations such institutions are managed carefully and they are prevented from collapse in any possible way that is the reason why so many regulations come in place so when you have when the bank as 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 a bank hsbc is into lending to customer consumer and for commercial lending as well as it is also very actively into investments right investments and financial market activities so they have their own bonds they have the investment bonds debentures they invest into other banks they lend into other banks and 
So there are a lot of different opportunities that they involve, indulge into in order to increase the profits from the markets. So now when HSBC interacts or say invests in stocks or bonds or into the into assets issued by other banks or other financial institutions right they expose them to some kind of a risk right so they expose them to different kind of risk like interest rate risk they've exposed themselves to exchange rate risk they expose themselves to asset price risk now suppose if hsbc is actually investing in an asset which is perhaps riding a bubble so given that the bubble collapses, HSBC loses out a huge amount of value on its investment. And hence, there's a huge loss that the bank actually occurs. Now, this shock will have its tremble somewhere down the line, which will actually affect the macroeconomic stability of the organization. So from India's perspective, State Bank of India is a globally systematically important financial institution. Within Indian demography, ICICI, HDFC are HDFC banks are systematically important financial institutions because they are major banking players today. So having seen this, uh, so having seen that, what we get clearly say is that such institutions need to be very carefully monitored. They need to be carefully regulated in order to prevent them from collapsing and to ensure that they survive periods of extreme downturns as well. So this is so this is why uh, you know these regulations have come up with the increase in the number of global systematically important financial institutions and these financial institutions when they have their exposure to the asset markets to these kind of markets when they are exposed to macroeconomic or market driven risk and the analysis of such risks is called market risk now market risk is when I, when I say about, when I talk about market risk, the question comes out that what type of a market? The market can be any kind of a market. Say, asset markets, it can be a risk which is affecting like the interest rate risk, it can be counterparty risk, it can be exchange rate risk, and a host of other such factors. Asset price risk, and so on. So, any... So just to just to interrupt one, so uh, any a, any entity, any organization, or any person with whomever the bank is investing is a market. Uh, no, the market Avishek is defined in the uh, common term that we understand. So the, it is not a market as in a physical marketplace, but it arises for an asset where there is a demand and supply and it's a non-lending asset it's a non-credit asset right okay. so basically it's a, okay. a loan or a, pers a personal loan or a uh, or a mortgage loan or a credit card does not fall under market risk because that's a credit product market risk of many bases or talks about factors or those assets which are there uh, like which are traded in the markets and are affected by market price fluctuations so I might be okay. talking about any kind of a tradable asset in that case. So any tradable asset market. Now, so for example, exchange rate. Now, exchange rate is not a market as such, right? So there is. So yes, yeah. you, you might have. Uh, if I think about yes, you are hedging yourself against exchange rate fluctuations or stuff. But exchange rate factors are important factors which affect asset prices or transaction in the asset markets, right? So they they affect import export. So in that way, it is a source of a market risk. It's a non-tradable risk. So I mean, non-tradable means I mean, it's, it's a non-credit risk. So any kind of risk which is affected by macroeconomic and market fluctuations fall under market risk. Okay. Right. Great. Ajaz, any queries up to this point? Fine. <clears throat> so, uh, 
so just to uh, talk about some of uh, the major kind of market risks right some of the major sources of uh, market risk sources of market risk Now, market risk has different kinds of risk. Or, I mean, the market risk may stem from different kinds of risk, as we discussed. First is an asset price risk. So, asset price risk. Then you have liquidity risk, also interest rate risk. Interest rate. Right. Then you have exchange rate risk. risk and finally what we have is the counterparty risk just increase this one. so the next what i have is the counterparty risk the next is the Next is the counterparty risk, right? So there are these different sources of the risk. Now, how is it a risk? Right. So uh, let's just start off with the asset price risk that we have that I've been talking about. Now, <clears throat> so over here, when I'm talking about uh, say asset price risk, so what I need to know is, or <clears throat> So basically, how is it that I can define an asset price risk? So basically, when I'm talking about an asset price risk, I'm talking about, say, basically the stock market risks, right? So the price, uh, so there is an asset A, which is uh, traded in the markets, right? And there is always a speculation which is going on in the market. So now, the question that comes out is, okay, I see that the asset, the price of an asset has been increasing. And it has been increasing, say, Say exponentially, it has been increasing over a span of time. So, so when I do this or when I uh, look into this, So basically, I have been monitoring the uh, asset price, the value of asset price over time, right? So let's let's say this is the time variable over here. The time. And over here, what I have is the price of the asset or the price of the asset over time, that is P. Now, what I see is that the price of the asset is going up. Say, basically, uh, this is the price of the asset, which is... So, can you name an asset in the very recent time where such a movement has actually been seen? 
you have seen this kind of a movie. just the example which bolo just the example that we discussed i guess housing one no no the housing one is okay so that's that has happened in the history i'm asking about the most recent times in the recent in the recent few days right edges uh, it is the bitcoins so over there the bitcoins asset price the, the price of bitcoins have been seen to increase like in a super exponential manner right so it has been seen that bitcoins have been the price in bitcoins have been increasing exponentially now the question that comes out over here is <clears throat> so the question that comes out over here is whether is this rise fundamental in nature so is it driven by the fundamentals is the price increase fundamental in nature or is it driven by or is it driven by irrational exuberance is it driven by the irrational exuberance so irrational exuberance is a term which talks about it's a you know it's a behavioral term which comes out where like people do not ration out their information set they do not have uh, ration out what are the, what are the the available information right and they take just the decisions based on what others are doing and at the back of the mind they are working as per a hard mentality which talks about measures like uh, you know where they are just investing because they feel that uh, why if others gain we would stand out but if if it falls then everyone will fall together so that is what is irrational exuberance so irrational exuberance is a tendency of investors or, or it's is a kind of a partial blindness of the investors right which they actually through which what they try to they try to just imitate the market patterns without thinking much about it so it's a kind of an extreme speculation scenario where the asset prices keep on rising exponentially and such that they go over above the fundamentals right so this is what is the overall idea about the final i mean about just a question about, yeah hmm. just a question about irrational exuberance mm -hmm. i uh, i just thought of this mm -hmm. so say suppose a company is a very big brand name mm -hmm. say hsbc mm -hmm. ibm or in uh, if i talk in india tata sbi right so they already have a reputed uh, name in the market mm -hmm. so any guy who is investing say he is a new investor in the market okay. and he is not that much a risk taker uh -huh. say, say suppose he, so then if he or she is investing mm -hmm. and he goes by the name of the company the reputation of the company mm -hmm. that this company stocks are not going to go down mm -hmm. very soon or i am not going to incur mm -hmm. a huge loss on this one if i invest so is uh, can that be named no, as that uh, irrational that is not irrational exuberance abhishek the reason is because hsbc has a line of business it has a market share it has a repute you know what the business plans are you have a project and you have a profit statement of the bank for the last 5 years 10 years right now irrational exuberance is something caused by possibilities not results right so let's take the case uh, for example let's go back in time right let's go back in time at a point of time in the year 1994 95 right so where amazon was coming out fresh google was coming out right now you did not you could what you could decipher was that it was ushering in a new age an online age an online bookstore right but that point of time the idea was very new people were not so accustomed to do this kind of shopping online so people were more like prone to go to bookstores and do it they were not so they were not so accustomed to some disruptive innovation kind of a framework right so what would happen is that so standing on that day i am an investor right so there is a venture capitalist who comes and finances amazon amazon gets 
listed in the stock markets or or like the shares are floated out now based on that idea right on the on that expectation that amazon can do you know can create magic over time people just go ahead and start investing in it but the nature of the business is such that for the first 5 to 10 years you might be running on losses and then you start seeing the money right so basically what would happen is i do not know that whether after that 10 years or the 5 years i would actually be able to see the money or i have to close down my business but over there there is an idea that okay this is an online store and this has these possibilities this is unleashing these possibilities and so on so it's a it's an expectation solely based on possibilities i am not banking on fundamentals i don't know if i hold a share of amazon whether will amazon pay me a dividend at the end of the year or not so what i am involved in is a gaga right that i'll just take the stocks i'll see the price rise i'll sell it off to someone someone will buy it and that is the way it happens right so initially when a company gets launched the share price is very less so your idea is that okay this is the idea that this company is bringing in and it can go to this part so there is a projection nothing else and based on that projection you are just investing your money into it right now you do not know what the fundamentals are the company's share price may not actually be worth anything suddenly you realize that for a share which you brought for 10 rupees because of some unknown factors because of some share exuberance because of some uh, share gaga which was going around in the market around some thought you had started investing money into it and you see that the suddenly the share price is uh, that share is trading in uh, at say 100 times what the original price of the share is but the question is had the fundamentals of the company changed in order to support that growth so has amazon as a company changed during that time during those 4 5 years to support that growth in the stock price so that is where the fundamentals of the company come in and the, and the fundamentals are classically defined in terms of the uh, the dividend stream that they, that that they are likely to pay in the future so today if it is 10 rupees what is the probability or how much of return do i expect in the next 10 years or or the, in the next 5 years or in the next one year so that future stream of dividend right so what where the price can go and where it is trading that differs determines how or that gap is what is your irrational exuberance now overnight i cannot gain i uh, my company cannot just you know grow 10 times or 20 times in size or in a span of one year so that takes time now today amazon has strong fundamentals it is doing wonderful business and their stocks are really trading at very high prices and that's absolutely okay i know that if i invest in amazon i'm not going to be a loser but when amazon actually started off i did not know where it would go i cannot see the future right so when i'm doing that and or when i'm trading like that on so when i i am just trading based on the market sentiments and what people are saying around me rather looking into its financial statements or into its fundamentals that is the part where i am running into irrational exuberance right if i do it for a proper bank today a multinational bank i would not be doing that because i know there is a brand name associated with the company and the stocks cannot suddenly overnight go valueless until and unless a huge fraud or a huge illegal activity is identified within an organization and the organization collapses but those chances are relatively less right so clear abhishek yeah absolutely fine so alternatively to my question mm -hmm. so if i say so uh, is just for an example uh -huh. uh, investment in any new startup mm -hmm. a high increase of investment in any new startup mm -hmm. is a irrational exuberance no irrational exuberance is not only an investment right so it is a kind of a phenomenon which is but it's an occurrence which prevails on the market it's a kind of a market sentiment where on the whole the market is not evaluating by the fundamentals but they are just going by the market sentiment that is prevailing and on the expectation that that i am just investing because i believe that it's a wonderful idea to invest in and that will give me huge profits 
right so for example when this online business or the app business started coming in right now it has been yeah. quite sometimes that app, app business have survived and people know what their actual potentials are but say for mm-hmm. example uh, when uh, flipkart or amazon uh, i mean when flipkart or snapdeal they came into india uh, i mean when they came into existence right what had happened is, so that was an idea at that point of time i don't know how the business is going to survive so had they floated out stocks in the market and people would have been buying it like crazy right so then that would have been called irrational exuberance now investment is not irrational exuberance irrational exuberance is a term or you know it's a kind of a market mania when i say that a market is undergoing a mania that's irrational exuberance. yeah so it's a prevalence okay. of a collective sentiment in the market it's not that investment so when i mean when on the whole the market is investing into a company it's a it's, it's an investment characteristic kind of it's a market sentiment it's a kind of, yeah okay it's an extreme form of a market mean okay right so this term irrational exuberance uh, was first coined by alan greenspan himself in the year 1996 to describe this market mania itself right so yeah so as i was saying just to come back so over here uh this market uh, so basically what i see is the asset price trajectory that i have over here right and if i fit a trend line to it you will see that it's a steep exponential trend line so what i can see is that the asset prices are growing every time so the growth rate is growing over time right so next thing that happens is so what i so basically whenever any asset price is increased the first question to answer is that what exactly is so is, what exactly is causing that increase or how risky is it to invest into the asset so to do this a simple comparison can be done right so suppose i want to invest into the stocks of say a new startup with a new idea right into an ai startup and people are talking all about ai and the the future potential that ai can actually unleash in fact in fact if you can think about it right i can say that or i can pictureize that analytics itself is a bubble so everyone is talking about analytics these days and businesses are investing into analytics they are investing millions of dollars to get our business impact but the question that remains is are the business impacts in proportion to the investments that is going in so is the job that an analyst is doing is it in relation to the salary that he is getting right so people quote salary packages like 20 lakhs 25 lakhs 30 lakhs now is it in relation to the and relation to the investment that companies are making are they reaping the benefits to that extent or is it that the companies are simply like they are like because walmart is investing so shop a stop is investing or is it like this right so is there a chance that a market may undergo a market correction is data an overhyped concept now if it is so if the market undergo some correction some day they might realize that the investment that they are doing into analytics is not that worthwhile and they might suddenly cut that off and thereby depleting the bubble so so basically how risky is it to invest into one technology right especially when you are investing into some new kind of a technology this question comes in so basically the idea is to understand that how do i identify this risk so to do that what i need to do is i need to understand how the asset price is actually traveling over time versus how has the you know the fundamentals of the company changed or how what exactly are the expected fundamentals so basically if corresponding to that if i can actually plot a dividend path right or a dividend series as i might say right so let uh, this part contain the dividend as well so i'll put it as dt right now i see that uh, say this is uh, how the dividend path looks like so what you see is that at each instance at each instant right the gap between the dividend path and this price path 
is actually increasing right so you see that the dividend so basically what i can clearly see from here is that this dividend path that i have over here is absolutely if i fit out a trend over here it's absolutely a non explosive line whereas if i fit a trend line to this stock market right so this is a path where it is explosive in nature so i get to see that the stock prices are increasing explosively but dividends are not or the or returns of the fundamentals of the company are not increasing to that extent so this gap right we identify a bubble and you know that you are actually investing into a bubble stock right? so, so bubble stocks are actually very risky stocks so if you can actually identify that you are actually investing into a bubble you know that you are actually investing into a very risky stock and there is a very high chance that overnight with, with when a small market correction or a small new strikes in the market it might explode itself into a huge panic thereby bringing down the you know thereby bringing down this uh, bubble and the asset prices and the asset prices might crash overnight and you might end, uh, and you might actually go bankrupt or you might get stuck with a low priced asset so you might actually realize that you've actually over high pay paid up much more than what it deserved to be paid right so uh, so that is so basically if i think about this this is nothing but a value at risk kind of a concept so how much of value at so what is the probability that the stock prices will not fall below a certain percentage in, su in such a span of time so that is say basically in the next one month what is the probability that the stock prices will not fall less than or will not fall uh, yeah, so so the the fall will be less than equal to 15% in the next 10 days. So that's what a value at risk is. So basically, when I'm talking, when I'm trying to assess such a risk, what I am the figure that I'm trying to compute or the figure to move at is the value at risk. So this value at risk concept will be a very important concept as we move forward to this path of uh, you know of these of market risk model development. So the concept of value at risk. Is something that would be of prime importance over here that is the value at risk right so asset price so basically if you have a suddenly a, a high value or value at risk then you know that there is a high element of uh, riskiness and so on so this is one very important concept which, which would be coming up over and over again. And most of the market risk models that we have involves uh, working at, I mean, working out the value at risk and understanding what is the riskiness, the overall portfolio riskiness, and so on. But however, we would also be exploring other, uh, you know, advanced model development techniques as well. So which talks about developing and predicting the market risk. Uh, so basically, if you have a portfolio, of a stock and uh, you want to predict what the volatility is going to be like some years down the line and based on that you use that input and you take your uh, market risk or your investment decisions as well there are important uh, important metrics right so we'll be talking about important ratios like price earning ratio price to sales ratio dividend yield etc right and uh, so and other uh, different kind of uh, financial metrics as well so this is a more or less what an idea. So this is, these are the different ways through which market risk actually arises, right? So this is one case of an asset price risk. So you actually run a very strong asset price. You run a risk uh, of losing your asset prices or you run a, a huge risk of committing to an asset price risk or an asset price shock if you are actually investing in a bubble asset, right? So these are uh, the different ways. and Going forward, we would be exploring exchange rate risk, interest rate risk, and counterparty credit risk as well. Right? Okay. So, uh, so let's stop here for the day. Today is just day one. I would not be going in to too much of it. Right? So next day, what we'll do is we'll explore 
two things uh, we'll try to explore each of these financial instruments uh, in details and we will uh, try to explore uh, these different source of market risk in greater details right so we'll explore not today we just started talking about asset price risk we'll finish this part so after that we'll talk about interest rate risk we'll talk about exchange rate risk and different regulations which are there in place to regulate the market risk for a uh, organization right okay so just one uh, okay so are there any questions uh, before i proceed okay great great so uh, just a quick uh, just a short announcement uh, i wish i can adjust so tomorrow's class i would not be taking uh, because actually tomorrow is my birthday so there would be a small function guests would be coming over so i would not be taking tomorrow's uh, session and the next class that we would have is on monday i uh, on uh, next saturday right and adjust the crm session the next crm revision session would be on wednesday wednesday 10 pm uh, to 11:30 pm ist thank you ajas thanks a lot and uh, hope to see you next week again thank you have a great week ahead thank you bye bye have a great week bye